Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Frontier Live. Thank you for joining us today, uh, Wednesday, March 24th, 2021. Uh, I'm your moderator today, Clifton Adcock, uh, reporter for the Frontier. So we're talking today about evictions, the federal eviction moratorium that's been in place for almost a year now, and how people who might be facing eviction can get help. Uh, and for those of you out there viewing the live feed today, first of all, thank you. And uh, secondly, if you have any questions you'd like asked, uh, go ahead and put those in the comments and we'll try to get to them by the end of the broadcast. So I'm joined today by Jeff Janes, Executive Director of Restore Hope Ministries in Tulsa, and Eric Hallett, Statewide Coordinator of Housing Advocacy at Legal Aid Services of Oklahoma. Uh, we're going to go through some of the issues uh, facing Oklahomans as far as rent and evictions. Uh, but first, Jeff, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, Restore Hope Ministries in Tulsa. Absolutely. I'm, I'm proud to be the executive director of Restore Hope Ministries. We are 43 years old. We started 43 years ago by the United Methodist Church to help families in need. And so uh, for most of that time, we've helped with food assistance. Uh, for the last 25 years, we've also helped with rent assistance. And so uh, helping with rent is not something new to us. It's something that we've done for a long time. And we do it really well. I'm proud of our amazing team um, that uh, since we've been tracking it with independent data, um, has a 100% success rate or a 99 plus percent success rate in keeping families from being homeless. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to prevent homelessness. It's part of the passion of my life too. Just personally, I grew up here in Tulsa um, and I grew up with a lot of opportunities, but I recognize that a lot of people didn't have the same opportunities that I did. And so it's a, it's a personal passion of mine to help those who, who are in need to, to be able to dream again, to, to, to find those dreams that, that everybody has uh, to do that again. And so I'm excited for the the work that we get to do and the work that uh, Restore Hope does for the community. Thanks. Uh, Eric, tell us a little bit about yourself and Legal Aid Services of Oklahoma. Hi, my name is Eric Hallett and I am a, the coordinator of housing advocacy for Legal Aid. I'm a lawyer, a housing lawyer. At Legal Aid, we service all 77 counties and we provide free legal help for civil legal matters to people who cannot afford an attorney. So we do have income guidelines and, and we only represent people within 200% of federal poverty guidelines. And we only do civil matters, which are so important in people's lives. Things like domestic violence protection and protection from eviction or help getting benefits like social security. Um, we help people with things, uh, those kinds of cases to keep those families stable and to keep them housed and to help the entire community um, and so I'm very honored to work with Restore Hope the last few years. Um, we share similar missions in keeping people housed. Um, and so I'm, I'm happy to be here today and answer questions. Great. Well, let's start out with the current situation. Obviously, we've been going through the COVID-19 <laughs> pandemic for more than a year now. And we're coming up on the one year anniversary on March 27th of the declaration by Congress of a federal eviction moratorium. So I'll uh, just put that out to both of you. What, what has uh, that moratorium meant for renters and why was it necessary? Um, necessary uh, for public health reasons because spreading COVID um, was dangerous to everybody. And when you become homeless, uh, or have to double up with people in homes, the likelihood of spreading it um, is worse. But more than that, uh, we have an unprecedented financial crisis that came from businesses closing and people being out of work. And that's not their fault. You know, it hurt everybody. Um, and so we were at risk of a flood of evictions. And our system just can't handle a flood of evictions. We have a great um, homelessness prevention teams here in Tulsa County um, with the shelters and housing solutions and all of us coming together to make these resources available, but we can't handle thousands of new families. Um, so that's what the federal laws were for. Yeah. And, and I agree with Eric completely. And I'm, I'm thankful that for, for our partnership together on this and so many other things that, that we, you know, studies have shown that the eviction moratorium has saved lives. Um, that was the goal of it, certainly for the C, from the CDC's perspective, uh, but in the immediate aftermath of the, the, the impact that COVID was making, um, it was keeping people out of, of, of large courtrooms that were, are usually packed with people. You know, Eric can tell this better than I can, but usually in a normal year, uh, which we certainly have not been in a while, but uh, the, the eviction court is packed with hundreds of, of tenants. Um, you know, there are potentially 250 cases um, in a two-hour span, and 
Um, that's not safe for those tenants. That's not safe for the landlords. It's not safe for the lawyers. It's not safe for the court staff. And so, um, and, and we were told constantly that we were needed to be safe at home, that we were safer at home. Um, if you don't have a home, it's hard to be safer at home. And so uh, the impact of COVID uh, was just incredible in that regard. And so we wanted people to be safe. And I'm thankful for that moratorium uh, that was put in place to keep people safe so that they, they didn't have to fear going to a, a packed courtroom um, to argue for their lives, to argue for their household. Now, the moratorium has, sev has had several incarnations. Um, first, Congress passed it on, uh, and it went into effect on March 27th of last year. Uh, then when that expired, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention picked it up and declared uh, a moratorium. Um, then Congress, back in December, extended that until March 31st of this year, coming up uh, one week uh, from today. Uh, now it looks like the CDC might issue another extension. That's in the works but it's unclear how long that extension would be for, and it's not set in stone yet. Um, Eric, as someone who in the courts, uh, what impact has this had on renters who are facing eviction? And uh, what would the end of the moratorium mean for renters eviction cases? So um, to take up uh, one thing you said is that, you know, that this, ex this is expiring in a week and the CDC may, issue a new order. But until then, if you are protected by the CDC, you won't be on April 1st. And you have to assume that. And we have thousands of families right now in Tulsa County who have been protected by the CDC moratorium on evictions since late August, when it went into effect September 4th. Those are from evictions starting back in August that people have had pending against them for a very long time. And on the first week of April, if the CDC doesn't extend it, all of those families could be hauled back into court and face eviction. That's why right now rental assistance is absolutely essential to us keeping people housed um, because we don't know what the federal government will do. Um, and, and truthfully, the first time the CDC order went into effect, while it was so helpful to so many families, it didn't couple that, um, that moratorium with help for the landlords. So we've had landlords suffering since the last round of funding went out. And um, this is gonna really help repair those relationships. So Jeff, uh, we've had um, uh, one round of uh, rental, rental assistance to the federal government um, uh, that Eric mentioned uh, uh, way back last year. And there were uh, some uh, locally uh, funded grants, I believe, through private foundations uh, last year as well. Uh, tell me a little bit about those earlier rounds of rent relief and how this most recent round uh, differs from those. Absolutely. You know, at first it was our community stepping up. At first it was the, the COVID relief fund from the Tulsa Area United Way and the Tulsa Community Found Foundation. They stepped up with some in initial relief to help uh, keep families from being homeless. And so starting May 1st of last year, we started, even though the courts were shut down at that point, um, we started to, to provide that assistance. Since that time, uh, with those funds, we've, we've shared, we've distributed over $700,000 in those relief funds that were donated by private individuals to that United Way and, and uh, TCF fund. Uh, then uh, when the courts reopened uh, June 1st, uh, the Schusterman family philanthropies really wanted to keep people out of court, um, uh, keep people safe. And so uh, they offered an open-ended grant for us to, to pay all of the, the back rent for everybody who was on the docket at that point and a month forward. Uh, thankfully, uh, about 15% of landlords took us up on that offer and we were able to, to help those, those folks and, and prevent those people from, from being evicted and from going, having to go to court. And then in uh, July of last year, the state uh, worked with Restore Hope and the county worked with Tulsa Housing Authority to provide rental assistance through the CARES Act. And that, those, that assistance together was about $8 million um, from, from those funds. And so all told in the past year, um, our community has received about $10 million in rent assistance from those various funds. 
Um, that's a lot of assistance. Uh, that's, you know, our, our biggest year before that was 300,000. And uh, that was uh, even a, a place where I had to go to our staff and say, that's, that's too much. It's more than our grants. And so um, it really was a significant increase uh, for our community to see that much uh, um, assistance, but it was needed. Uh, the impact of COVID was deep and it was wide. We saw some tremendously high bills um, and uh, people who were asking for help uh, who had never had to ask for help before. And so, uh, unfortunately, those funds did have a, an expiration date themselves. You know, they um, they had to be spent by a certain time. And so, um, since November, the end of November of last year, there hasn't been um, a, a major rent assistance program in our community. Uh, we've helped with some funding here and there, but but not a, a major program. And so, March fifteenth, just a couple a week, just last week, <laughs> last Monday, um, we launched a new program using the the funds from the second CARES Act. Um, uh, the, the bill that was passed toward the end of the year last year, December 21st, it was passed, it was signed into law on December 27th. That provided $25 billion across the country. Uh, of that funding, about uh, $12 million came to the city of Tulsa, about $7.5 million came to Tulsa County, and then the state received another pool of funding. Um, and so we launched that program for Tulsa and Tulsa County uh, last Monday. And since last Monday, we've already received over 2,900 applications uh, for assistance. And I think that gets to Eric's point, uh, that there is a lot of need out there, that 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 moratorium needs to be paired with assistance. Now, they, they need to both be there. And I, I would argue that the federal government should extend the current moratorium, but we should extend it with the assistance that we're providing now uh, so that we're, we're helping the tenants stay safe, but we're also helping those landlords who do have those bills. You know. What we would hope for with this new program is that tenants would apply and landlords would receive the funds. And so that's that's a benefit to both of them. Now, are there any limitations on the uh, current round of funding or uh, it can also go for utility too, is that right? It can. So unlike the other funding, we are able to use it for both rent and utilities. We're able to pay back rent and forward rent. We actually can pay up to three months forward. Uh, and that's what, you know, in the, the Schusterman pr uh, program that we had last year, we were trying to prevent evictions for the next three months, and we were trying to do that with a contract. And, and like I said, only about 15% of landlords took us up on that contract. Um, so it, with the State CARES Act program and then this new one, um, we, we decided we're, we need to pay forward so that we can, we can help those renters going forward. And it does help the landlords too in that way. There are some income guidelines. They need to be under 80% of the area median, median income. That's not a number that I have memorized. <laughs> so we have that de detail on our website with the frequently asked questions and the application portal um, helps to, to manage that as well. So under 80% of the area median income and they do need to have some impact uh, from COVID-19. Um, it could be direct, like they lost their job because of COVID-19. A lot of folks who were in the hospitality industry uh, lost their job because their restaurant or hotel shut down. That's a, that's a clear, obvious direct impact. But some of it was indirect. Um, you know, folks had to stay home and had to buy education supplies for their kids remote learning, um, or they had other kind of indirect impacts, their expenses went up uh, from buying PPE and other things. And so those would be considered a COVID impact under this new program. And, and the other way that that it shows eligibility is unemployment. If somebody has qualified for unemployment since last March 13th, uh, then they also would be eligible for the program. Now, Eric, there's uh, been an eviction moratorium in place, but as you said, and uh, our reporting has shown at the frontier, there are still people who are getting evicted anyway. I don't think a lot of people understand how that can happen if this federal uh, moratorium is in place. Can you explain some of the ways that these evictions are still occurring anyway? Sure. And that's a great question because the TU law students did a an observational study at our courthouse back in January of 2020, right before the moratorium. And at that time, um, they found that 97% of the evictions filed in Tulsa County were for money. And so the CDC says, we will not have evictions based on money. You would think all evictions would end. But the truth is, evictions did not end. Evictions have been full steam since June 1st in Tulsa County. It's the only court that has been open full time uh, for in-person meetings since June 1st. Um, and uh, a lot of people default. A lot of people never show up or participate in court processes. And so if you don't show up, 
either because you had transportation problems or a job or kids that you had to deal with, um, you know, school and things like that. Um, or because your landlord said, don't worry about it. If you don't show up, you lose and you can become homeless within two days after that. Um, so a lot of people don't show up to court and these evictions continue to get filed because half of the people won't show up. Um, and then, um, you know, our laws are a little bit landlord friendly. And um, traditionally, we didn't have a lot of assistance at the courthouse for tenants. Um, now that has changed. Um, but, but what we see is that year over year, in January of this year, evictions were only down by a third. So we normally have 1,200 a month. They were down to 800 um, a year into the pandemic. And the CDC should have reduced it all the way. Um, but not only are people still being evicted for rent, um, even when they show up to court and ask for help and take the, uh, the, um, the, the rights given to them under the CDC moratorium, um, they might find themselves hauled back into court to prove that they remain poor. And so families that thought they were protected, that did everything right, you know, may get uh, new court papers. And if they don't show up that next time, they become evicted, even though they should have been protected by the CDC. And that's um, a really tough place for tenants to be in. It's the most important thing you can do as a tenant, um, if you're facing eviction, is to ask for help. Um, ask for rent assistance, ask for legal assistance, because those things are available in our community to keep people housed. And it's having a lawyer on your side can be helpful just to get you through the process, because it's scary being in that building uh, with all the protocols and the way people act around each other and the magic words they say. You know, lawyers are skilled to do that for you. Um, but we also find that people are taken advantage of and are being charged too much or they're being evicted for reasons that aren't fair. And a lawyer can really help tell your story to the court and keep you housed longer and have your um, debts lowered. So um, yes, the eviction crisis in Tulsa was you know, 11th highest in the nation before uh, this all started. And we are continuing to meet that mark, unfortunately. Um, yeah. I'll oh, go on, I'm sorry. I was just gonna piggyback on, on what Eric said because that the TU law students, they also found that, that most of the time um, in those court proceedings, the landlord is represented by an attorney. So the landlord has an attorney there most of the time. I think it's 90% of the time. Um, and tenants, even if they do show up, um, very rarely take up the offer for legal assistance, uh, and they really should. We all need help. You know, everybody needs help with something sometime. Um, and and if, especially in that court environment, um, having the help of legal aid who is providing those great services at no cost to the, to the tenant, uh, that's a tremendous benefit. And it evens the playing field. You know, the, the, the scale of justice is, is supposed to be balanced. Um, and and that's, that's a really important factor in, in eviction cases, because quite often um, those, those scales are, are tipped um, in, on one side or the other, or just to one side, just to the, the side of the landlord. And when you're talking about somebody's housing, when you're talking about their basic you know, human need of, of having a roof over their head, um, there's fear. Uh, there's a power dynamic. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it, let alone the fact that those court hearings can be scheduled at a time when it's difficult for a tenant to, to be there. Um, the landlord is usually represented. They're not usually there at all, um, where, whereas the tenant is forced to be there. Yeah, in Tulsa County, um, it is pretty unique in that it is absolutely an unfair process. The landlords uh, do not have to show up to court. So court in Tulsa County is at two o'clock and three o'clock and four o'clock. That's when my kids are getting out of school. That's when I'm, you know, still at work for a few hours. That's, it's hard to make court at two o'clock. The landlords in Tulsa, if they don't have to be there, they don't have those same burdens. And so it's cheap and easy for them to haul you in court over and over again. Um, it's, it's, it is really unfair in Tulsa County. Other counties aren't like that, um, but we're working to make those changes. And one thing I noticed, I, I sit in on uh, some of the uh, eviction court uh, dockets uh, earlier this year. And uh, one thing I noticed was, um, and which attorneys have told me they've seen more and more of, 
are individuals who are on a month to month agreement uh, for their rent. And when uh, they don't pay their, uh, their rent and an eviction uh, notice is filed, um, oftentimes that will be for, I guess, what's called possession only of the property. The landlord won't ask for back rent, which gets around the CDC order. H have you seen a lot of that recently? So landlords, um, landlords are also suffering. So I certainly don't want to diminish the, you know, the, what they're going through. But landlord attorneys have gotten very creative in finding ways to get around the CDC uh, moratorium on evictions. And that's what lawyers do. We find loopholes and we exploit them. Um, and unfortunately, um, that results in people getting evicted who should be protected. And one way people get evicted is, um, is being sued for possession on a month to month lease. And, and that's really a fault of the current CDC plan is that, you know, once your lease expires, you're not being evicted because of rent. You're being evicted because you no longer have a contract. Um, so the CDC moratorium doesn't explicitly prohibit that. And so landlords are using that. Um, and, and since the last year, people have been protected by various moratoria, you know, those one year leases, those six month leases are, have expired. And so more and more, the CDC moratorium doesn't actually help families because they are not under a lease. Um, and then we also see a, a dramatic increase in for cause evictions, um, meaning that the landlord claims that the tenant needs to move because they've broken rules, because they've done something that the landlord didn't like. And so we are defending a lot of cases like that these days where the landlord really wants money, but um, the only way they're gonna get the tenant out is if they say the tenant did something wrong. And so when in the past, they might not have you know, cared that the tenant walked on the left side of the sidewalk. Now that's a big issue and they want the person evicted for it. And so we're defending all kinds of crazy rule breaking right now. If, if both of you could describe for me a situation where this eviction moratorium was never passed or, or a situation where, this, uh, where rental assistance was never delivered. How different would the situation be right now? I, I mean, we would have a lot of homeless people. <laughs> visible homelessness would be increased. Um, we've seen visible homelessness increase down in South Tulsa, 71st and Memorial. We have shopkeepers all the time that are complaining, you know, I'm shooing people off the sidewalk, cleaning up messes. Um, that is a result of homelessness. People need a place to sleep and your sidewalk may be it. And we would have an increase in that. We've helped 1,600 families since last May, and, and all of those families um, had, uh, most of those families had an eviction pending. Um, and so you can imagine that had the, the moratorium not been there, um, had they not been able to pay, those 1,600 families would have been added. That's, a, that's over 4,000 people. Uh, the, the point in time count, which is a, a snapshot, it's not really uh, the, the greatest picture, but it's the, one of the best pictures we have of the, the homelessness uh, issue in our community. Um, has about 1,100 folks that are, are homeless um, between the shelters and, and the, the, those who are out on the street. Um, imagine adding 4,000 more into that mix. That's four times what's currently out there. Um, our system, none of our systems are built for that. Um, and, and to add on to that, uh, even the court cases themselves, you would have had hundreds of people in court arguing um, for their, their household, arguing for their livelihood, um, and COVID would have spread. And again, Data has shown that that the moratoria uh, saved lives because they didn't put people into those crowded rooms. They didn't put people. They didn't make people double up um, in unsafe environments. That they found that when people doubled up, when they stayed with a friend or a family member, that COVID spread at a higher rate, um, and that hospitalizations and deaths spread at a higher rate. And so it is not. I mean, and, and then that's not even con consider the the cold snap that we had in February in which a, a man did pass away, um, but had all of those people who had been prevented from being homeless, prevented from being evicted, had they also been homeless at that time, um, you know, that number would have been dramatically higher. We helped a, a family, uh, thanks to the help of legal aid and, and the, the communication we had together, the partnership we had together, we helped a 70 year old woman um, who, wh whose landlord had actually the legal right to kick them out. 
um, uh, we helped her prevent homelessness in the midst of that um, cold snap, um, that a 70 year old woman without any kind of transportation, um, she would have been in the street in the middle of record cold um, and may not be alive today had, had that moratorium and had our partnership not existed, had, had we not been able to help um, that landlord, you know, for her to cover that bill. Um, you know, I just, I can't even fathom what could, what that, that world could look like. Um, because, uh, like I said, so many people were in need for the very first time and that safety net that, that so many people rely on just wasn't there. Uh, and so I'm thankful that we were able to be part of that safety net. I'm thankful for legal aid that they were able to be a part of that. And, and so, uh, that more, those, that moratorium, uh, those moratoria and the, the assistance that was provided truly did save lives for the past year. And, and I think, um, consider that even without this massive influx of potential homelessness and evictions that are resulting from economic collapse due to coronavirus, um, even without that, eviction is horribly destabilizing for that family, but also for our community because it increases, you know, uh, emergency room use that we all pay for. It increases our insurance premiums. It increases use of emergency services and shelters that we pay for. Um, it removes kids from their classroom and moves them to other classrooms or, or without even class for a period of time, um, which disrupts their education that we are paying for. And then they are behind and we have to pay for additional services for them. So this is really, um, you know, it, it benefits the entire community to not have eviction. Um, they say that eviction can uh, cause financial stress on a family for two years because you don't just lose your home, you lose everything. I mean, you, the law gives you two days to move your stuff out. And most people can't do that. If you can't afford, you know, to even get to court to defend yourself, um, then you certainly can't afford to rent a truck and move your things. Um, so we would have just taken all of those negative consequences of eviction and added that to 4,000 more people. So um, this is vital to keeping our economy and our community safe. And that eviction goes on, on the, 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 the tenant's record. It goes Forever. on their credit for, for yeah. And, and so they're, you know, they may be in a crisis now because of COVID. They may be in a crisis because they, they lost their, their job, um, you know, because of the, the impact of COVID that filing of an eviction stays on their credit. So then uh, when they get their job back, when the economy comes back, uh, now they're held back because of that thing that happened in the past. And so again, as, as Eric said, evictions always have an economic impact, not just on the landlord and tenant, um, but uh, you know, think about the, 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 the car dealer who they, they may wanna buy a car from eventually, or the, the realtor who wants to sell them a house or the, the bank or you know, Eric, wisely pointed out the school system. I mean, uh, we have seen through uh, academic studies here in Tulsa uh, that evictions have, have played a role in increased mobility of students, decreasing academic potential. Um, you know, evictions, it, it was a problem before COVID. It's certainly been a problem during COVID, um, but it, it's not just a problem for those people. Um, it's a problem for us. It's a problem for all people. It's a problem for our neighbors. It's a problem for our community. And we need to work together to solve that problem. We need landlords and tenants to work together. Um, and we need everybody to be part of this solution and not to continue to, to perpetuate the problem. I, I guess, what, what are your takeaways on the effects of this pandemic on a societal level, as far as the, the landlords, tenants, and the, the system of rent go? I mean, do we just go back to normal after this is over? I sure hope not. One of the things that we've tried to do with our assistance programs is to try to not just not just plan for the current problem, but to look ahead and see how we can build in some systems of care um, and, and to really look at the whole system writ large. And so, you know, we had actually Legal Aid and Restore Hope had just begun um, in the six months before COVID hit um, to start having some of those conversations. And, and those conversations um, that started between Restore Hope and Legal Aid and a few others, eventually, you know, we're up at the mayor's level. Um, and so we, we brought other partners in because, you know, we recognize that, you know, Eric mentioned a flood elections earlier. You know, when, when there's a flood, you can do two things. You can sandbag individual houses or you can build a levee. My house uh, and Restore Hope were both protected uh, in the May 19 floods uh, of, of 2019 um, by a levee. 
Uh, I didn't have to go out and sandbag. I didn't have to put Visqueen out and, and, and sandbag my individual house because our community 75 years ago built a lab to keep people safe. Um, we can talk about the assistance that we're providing to individuals and families. And I'm so thankful that we've been able to do that for 1600 households and 4,000 in individuals. Um, but if we're not also looking at how we can build those levies of support um, to, I mean, in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, 75% um, of the evictions that are filed are paid for by four companies. That's a problem. Those, those companies have an economic a, a profit motive, a, a profit based uh, motive to file more evictions. And so when we work with, we, we talk to landlords and say, hey, please don't evict for the next 90 days because we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, their attorneys uh, and, and those who are paying for those evictions don't have a a, a money-based interest in preventing those evictions. And so they don't sign our contract to prevent those evictions. They don't go through the free um, and neutral, you know, third party, which is the early settlement mediation program. Um, there are things that we can do together that don't cause the problem to be worse. Um, right now, there are, there are some engines in our, in our economy that they're incentivized to, to evict more people. Um, that's how they make money. And I'm, you know, people got to make money in, in a, ver a variety of ways. I'm glad that I get to, to, to work at Restore Hope. I'm glad uh, for the work that, that Eric's doing at Legal Aid. I know that there are lots of other businesses out there, but, but, but we have businesses in our community that are, that are benefiting off of the pain of others. Um, and that's a problem. Uh, we, need to, we need to work to resolve that. And so um, as we've been building these individual systems to help with individuals as we've been sandbagging those houses we've also tried to figure out ways to use some of that sand to build up the levy um, so that we can can not just when COVID is over um, but for the long term have the kind of society that honestly that we want right we don't want people to to, to have to go to court over fifty dollars which happens people get evicted over fifty dollar fees um, um, we don't we, we we should work together neighbor and neighbor across a table to, to talk to one another about how we can how we can best help our community and so those are the kinds of conversations that we've we've tried to to, to start um and that's we've we've tried to use some of this the funding that we have uh, to build up some of that conversation build up that levy absolutely and and I, um, and I know Jeff as well, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, um, I'm real grateful to Mayor Bynum for showing leadership and bringing our groups together to work on these problems. You don't get to the 11th and the highest eviction rate rating without working at it. Um, there are much poorer communities in Tulsa with lower income, higher poverty, more expensive housing that have below average eviction rates. Tulsa County is three times the national rate when it comes to eviction. Um, and that's because, as Jeff said, we have companies in town whose only job it is to profit from evicting people. They are debt collectors who have set the tone in Tulsa County court system for a decade. Um, and they represent 75% of all evictions that are filed. Um, one of the unique and interesting um, good consequences that have come out of this um, is that there has been a reduction in what we call serial eviction. So we see families who will uh, get evicted over and over again by the same landlord, never thrown out of their homes, but every month they get sued because when they get sued for the eviction, they get to add those court costs, those attorney's fees, and then they add an eviction fee and a late fee. And so families whose rent is only 600 a month are paying 900 per month because of the fees. And that traps them in a cycle of financial abuse that prevents them from supporting their family in a way that is economically healthy for all of us. It's just taking profits for this middleman companies. Um, so we have seen a reduction in those serial evictions. I know Jeff um, has, we've both had this client that um, she'd been evicted 70, 68 times in 11 years by the same landlord. And the only problem was that she got paid a few days later than her rent was due. And so as soon as we could, you know, get as soon as she got ahead of the game, she no longer had that burden on her family, but she had 
tens of $10,000 or more of fees that she had paid that could have went to her children's education, that could have went to better health care and dental care, um, you know, summer camp, anything. Um, so in Tulsa County, yes, it's, it's a unique problem for us because of these eviction companies that are that have these relationships with multifamily property owners and have convinced them that eviction is a cheap and easy way to generate income, sadly. And, and I, you know, to that point, most of the landlords, the mom and pop landlords, the folks that have one or two houses, uh, for the most part, they're not contributing to these ridiculous numbers. Uh, and for the most part, it's not even the multifamily properties that are based in Oklahoma. Um, <laughs> It, it's money that is, it's, all of those fees are being shipped out to California and New York. Um, there are companies that have come in from Nashville to, to, to buy up properties in, in the Tulsa area, just so that, because they heard that our, uh, the structure is, is a little bit easier for them to use. And so we all of a sudden started to see a lot of evictions coming from those companies. Um, and so they're following that same kind of profit motive. We, we need our, we, we want our resources to stay here. Uh, and, and, and honestly, when, when I think about it, it pains me because, you know, we want to keep those families from being evicted and we're using philanthropic dollars, tax dollars that we would rather stay here in our community. Um, but instead of it staying here in our community, it's going to California and New York and all of those other places. Um, and I, those are fine states. It's, there's nothing against California, and New York, uh, but but we should have where our investments stay here. We, those 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 resources, those philanthropic resources, those tax dollars. We want those to be to be right here. And so I will say, when we see a local company take over a complex, usually that means a lowering of of evictions. Usually that means that the people in that complex are treated more humanely because they're not a number on a balance sheet. They're a name. They're, 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 they're Joe, they're Jane, um, they're, they're the neighbor. Um, when we start treating each other like neighbors, that changes the game. When we, when we treat people like numbers, then we're just going to continue having this, this cycle. And when, when the COVID impact goes away, uh, God willing, um, uh, then, then those, if, if people are still motivated by the numbers, then we're still going to have a problem. But if they're motivated by their neighbors, then we can actually solve the problem. Yeah, hopefully we're on the downswing of the pandemic. Do, do either one of you expect to see another round of rent assistance uh, coming out of Congress uh, by the time it ends or uh, shortly after it ends? Another round was just um, uh, approved. So the American Rescue Plan did approve another um, several billion dollars nationally um, for more rent assistance. We really don't know a, a whole lot about that fund yet. Uh, we, you know, I will say we launched our, our program for the CARES 2 program, the one that was passed at the end of the year last year. We launched on March 15th, last Monday. The, the Treasury Department, who uh, supervises those funds, released their most recent guidance the next day. And so, you know, we've talked about building the rocket ship while we've la while we're launching. <laughs> we're we're adapting and changing it, you know, mid mid air uh, to try to to adjust. Um, uh, you know, so uh, we need Elon Musk, I guess, to come help us to, to, to get this going. But uh, no, we, you know, so we don't yet know what the American Rescue Plan um, funding is going to look like. My hope is that it doesn't have the same kind of December 31st, 2021 deadline um, that it allows us to go forward. I will say we've heard some initial conversation from Treasury that they're, that they're learning from previous programs. Uh, we can see that in the current program that we're working on now. You can tell that they learned from the CARES Act assistance that was passed and, and funded last year. Um, there are some really good new changes to this plan. Um, and my hope is that we'll continue to see that. And actually, I think one of those things that you'll continue to see is continued partnership between um, financial assistance, like what Restore, Restore Hope is able to do, and legal assistance, which is what Lead is able to do, uh, to see those things paired together um, is, is huge uh, because we need to level the playing field. Um, we need to, to, to bring assistance together uh, on both financial and legal. I'll tell you, we help people with, with financial assistance toward the end of the year last year. And I had to, to argue with several landlords who still evicted, even though we had already paid their rent. They were evicting based on those fees that we were talking about. And we had to say, no, we've paid their rent. You can't evict them. And so uh, that's where that legal assistance kind of walking alongside the financial assistance comes in uh, to be really important because, you know, 
I'm a taxpayer. We're taxpayers. We want to make sure that our taxpayer dollars are, are used well. And I don't want to pay somebody's rent with my tax dollars and then have the landlord evict them anyway. Um, that's not what the goal of those tax dollars was for. And so um, the, the, the balancing of financial assistance and legal assistance is not just good for the tenant, it's also good for the taxpayer um, to make sure that we're using those funds well um, and that it's accomplishing the purpose uh, for which it was made. Yeah, absolutely. We were able to find fraud last time from you know bad actors, people who I had a, a woman call and say, I, I got this notice to pay rent, but I don't owe rent. I said, well, did you talk to your landlord? She said, well, he said if I would just go along with it, he would get extra money from rent assistance to pay for upgrades. And I'm like, we're not doing that, ma'am. <laughs> so we help stop fraud, you know, and, and bad fees. And it is essential that we have these partnerships in the community to, to be good stewards of, you know, what we've been um, given. Right. Uh, speaking of fees, let's let's get to some of the uh, viewer questions here. Um, I've got one here. It says uh, sometimes it's not the eviction, but the mounting late slash overdue fees that create deeper indebtedness. Is there a way to waive late fees? I'll say I'll, I'm I'm confident Eric can can chime in on this. I, I will say that uh, to some extent that's up to the landlord. Um, you know, I will say that with our new rent assistance program, we told landlords yesterday we were on a, a conference call with landlords about our new program, and we said if you waive late fees, if you waive those court costs, then then that helps us to 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 spend the money well. It also will prioritize those applications, and so when we have somebody who is willing to to waive those late fees that application gets it gets a little bit higher priority. There's a great new program that was launched by the city of Tulsa last week called the Gold Star Landlord Program. Uh, that's a great program that would help reduce some of those fees and costs. So Eric can speak more, more directly about late fees, but yes, landlords can certainly waive them. And, and honestly, um, it, like Jeff said earlier, it's not our local small investors who are the problem. It is the large um, out-of-state multifamily corporations that are the big problem when it comes to fees. And those are those dollars that are getting pulled straight out of our economy, those fees. The truth is in Oklahoma, penalties are not allowed in contracts. And so if a late fee is $100 a month, or it's a daily late fee, well, that really is just there to penalize the tenant. And if it comes before one of our attorneys, um, we are going to challenge that in the court. And the court is not going to grant those late fees. Um, so um, I would combine with that, that um, our law says that the landlord must mitigate their damages. Um, and that just means that they need to, they can't sue the tenant um, for, more than they should. They first have to try to reduce that. And then right now they do that by going with rent assistance. Um, and so if they're not accepting rent assistance and they wanna extract a bunch of fees, we are gonna fight back on that. Um, obviously we're not gonna let people become homeless if we can prevent it. Um, but I am you know, 100% willing to go before the judge and say, this landlord, your honor, you should find they don't get anything because what they're asking for isn't lawful. Um, and some, sometimes that will work on, you know, depending on how people are being reasonable. The important thing is to get people paid and to keep people housed, not to be profiteering off of, you know, the generosity of the taxpayers. We saw with um, unemployment, you know, 25% of all claims in Oklahoma were fraud. Um, so we are going to work to keep that down. Well, and I would add to that, I, we, well, we, in our conversation with the landlords yesterday, we told them that, that we can't pay for an empty apartment. If they evict somebody, we can't <laughs> pay any of that back rent. And the, the, the funding follows the tenant because the tenant is the one who's eligible. And so if they evict, then we can't help them. And so it's in their financial best interest to, to keep that family housed. It's in their financial best interest for, and it's faster for them if, if they waive those late fees. We can't pay some of those court costs that they that they want to charge. And so um, if they want those resources, the best way to do it is to to be neighborly, uh, waive those fees and, and allow us to help those families when we can. Another question from a viewer. Uh, what is being done about predatory landlords like repeat eviction filers and those that are clearly taking advantage of renters? So 
the great thing about these partnerships that we've been forming the last two years is that we're learning from each other about these very problems. Um, we're also working with um, Open Justice Oklahoma and, and uh, Oklahoma Policy Institute to gather data. And um, we're getting stories from Restore Hope and from Legal Aid, and we're coming together and figuring out these really bad landlord practices. And like you said, and we talked about earlier, predatory landlords are a problem in Tulsa. Um, what's being done is um, we're all working together to solve this problem. We are um, advocating with the courts and with the legislature and um, and then the legal aid attorneys are fighting them in court every day. Um, but we are looking at this also from the perspective of it being housing discrimination because a lot of predatory behavior only happens um, in certain areas, like the landlord will target a part of town where their tenants are mostly black or brown people. You know, they'll be targeting um, the disabled. They target people for exploitation, people without uh, as many resources, people who are vulnerable to exploitation. So we will be taking those claims to federal court and saying, you know, this landlord is committing discrimination and harming all of us. Um, we um, do have a housing discrimination team at Legal Aid, and we've been pretty successful. So um, that is just one of our tools. We will, as a community, we will come together and we will continue to fight until Tulsa no longer has to, you know, suffer under being the 11th highest eviction rate in the nation, you know, robbing our economy of resources that could go towards parks and art and healthcare and those things that we love and that, that we need in life. Well, and, and to add on top of that, I'm uh, again thankful for, for Mayor Bynum and, and his team's leadership in supporting the Gold Star Landlord Program. So in addition to, to going after the bad landlords, we need to support good landlords. We need to celebrate good landlords. Um, and so we need to, to give them that gold star of, of approval to say, well done. Um, and those landlords are using good practices, um, practices that a, a lot of landlords are using, um, but, but not as many as we would like. And so things like the, 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 the early settlement mediation program that is free and, and, and neutral. And for mediation, instead of suing somebody, instead of taking them to court, you can go through mediation and it's, it's effective over 90% of the time at resolving the differences for both the landlord and the tenant, both of them come out um, uh, with a good resolution. Um, it, it encourages safe and healthy homes and so the health department has a program to make sure um, that people are living in habitable conditions, you would be amazed at the living conditions that some of our neighbors live in right here in Tulsa, uh, one of our housing inspectors also served in the infantry in Iraq. And he said he went into mud huts in Iraq that were in better condition than some of the houses that he was asked to inspect, uh, the apartments that he was asked to inspect here in Tulsa. Um, so we want landlords to have good housing, safe and healthy homes. Um, and, and we want um, those landlords to be part of the affordable housing wait list so that if somebody is on a wait list, uh, they can move into that apartment and, and be part of that. And so that Gold Star Landlord Program, in addition to fighting bad landlords, we need to celebrate the great landlords uh, in our community. And there are a lot of great landlords in our community. Most of the, you know, it's a few bad apples that are ruining the bunch, um, but, um, but we need to celebrate the really good uh, folks in our community that are really trying hard. There are a lot of those local landlords who have waived late fees, who have done all those good things, and, and we're really happy to help with them. I have one question here uh, just about the application process uh, for um, uh, rent assistance. Uh, they ask, uh, will, will information uh, shared on the application be shared with government agencies? So it, it's a it's federal property. So it, you know it's it's a federal program in a sense. So uh, so they have the right to look at any of that data. But uh, for the most part, the way that monitoring works is they pick um, different names here and there um, that uh, they want to look and make sure that we have the appropriate documentation for. We are tasked by the taxpayers to make sure that we're spending the money the way the taxpayers want the money to be spent. Um, and we'll, so we have extensive contracts with the city and the county and, and others to make sure that we're doing that. So we. We have, a, we have to do our due diligence, but the way that that usually works from the monitoring perspective is they usually pick um, at random, so we will never know which ones they will pick, so we need to make sure all of them are eligible, um, but they'll only pick a few, so it's not like we're, we don't have a direct feed to the federal government or anything like that. Um, I will say that um, the federal government has said that undocumented um, folks are eligible for the program, and so social security number is not required um, by our program. 
And so that's not something that somebody should be concerned with if that's a, if a particular fear. And also the, the Biden administration um, stopped defending the, the Trump administration's public charge rule in court. And so it, it's not considered a public charge or anything. It's not going to hurt other aspects of, of your experience in the United States if you're trying to apply for, um, for citizenship. Um, receiving assistance is not going to negatively affect that. And so um, it is it is technically part of that uh, connection with the federal government and the state and, and city and county. Um, but the way that that monitoring usually works is 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 aggregated in information or um, that kind of at random selection of names so that we can make sure that the documentation is good. And we should want that, right? We should want sunlight on those programs. We should want to make sure that, that Restore Hope is doing it well. Um, and certainly we are on our end, but, but uh, I don't fault the, the government for wanting to make sure that that's the case too. Yeah, audits and accountability go hand in hand. But yeah. if a random person off the street goes up to Jeff and says, show me your files, he's going to say no. Nope. And that's the same for me. Obviously, if you work with legal aid, you're working with a lawyer, you have lawyer client privilege, um, your information is not being shared. Um, and for the tenants who take advantage of this program, not only are they not a public charge, they're also not going to pay taxes on this, this income. Um, now, landlords, you know, are receiving revenue, so they're going to have to talk to their tax professional about, you know, revenue. Um, but um, it's not like... Um, yeah, no one's going to be audited for tax purposes through this. They're just, the audits are to ensure that we are spending the money correctly or that Mr. Hope is. Yeah. And we will. Another question. Uh, if someone received assistance in the very beginning, are they disqualified from further assistance? No, there's not a disqualification for somebody who has received previous assist assistance. Obviously, we can't assist for the same month, right? We can't cover the same month. Uh, but the cap for this program is based on a month cap. And so if you've received assistance for that month, obviously we can't help with that month, but um, we have a specific amount of months that we're able to help with. And so um, let's say you received help for a couple of months. Um, we still have the assistance available for, for, for more months to be able to help. And again, we can go backward and forward. Um, after three months, we need to recertify that the, the, the person is still eligible. Um, we could continue to support going forward potentially. Um, even going forward. So no, prior assistance is not going to, to re re restrict somebody from getting assistance. The other thing that I would say is if you are in um, public housing, if you do receive some help for your housing, um, you can still get help for the tenant owed portion of your rent. And so we obviously can't help from the government owed portion, but uh, uh, for the tenant owed portion, the amount that you pay every month, if you're a tenant, um, then, uh, then we could potentially help with that. And we can help with utilities. I will also say on the utilities piece, we can only help renters with utilities. Um, we can't help homeowners with utilities. Uh, another question. Uh, do the panelists see social media or non-traditional tools as helpful to spread the word? For example, I was struck by how few folks that are evicted know about having a lawyer, program details, etc. I mean, we're here today. <laughs> so yes, we certainly see the value of that. And more and more people get their information uh, from Facebook or from Google um, and other online resources. So we certainly take advantage of that. You apply for um, Jeff's program on the internet. Um, it is. Yeah. It is. Um, and yeah. We have specific outreach. Sorry, Eric. We have, but we have specific outreach specifically using social media to, to spread the word. And so, and I'm confident that a lot of the 900 people who have applied in the past week have, they found out about it maybe through traditional media, but a lot of them found out about it through their friends sharing posts and, and, and making sure that their friends knew about that need. So we're, we're absolutely supportive of, of social media. Sorry, Eric. No, I was, I was just going to add um, that, you know, it does present a barrier to poor people and people in rural communities who don't have good internet connectivity. So, um, so for my job, especially, I have to be out in the community talking to people in those other counties because they might not find out about me otherwise. 
Well, and I would say that that's one of the reasons why we're so thankful to partner with Legal Aid because they're out in those other counties. Um, we want to try to bridge that digital divide as much as we can. So we want we don't want somebody not having a computer or not having access to the internet to keep them from assistance. And so uh, we'll be working with uh, other agencies. We'll be working with Legal Aid, obviously, uh, to, to find ways to help people bridge that divide. And, and we do have a phone number that they could call as well. Um, if they can't uh, access the the internet, if they can't access the program, and by the way, the application you can use your phone. Um, you can apply on your phone. We've been told you can apply through a gaming system as long as it's connected wow. to the internet. So, uh, uh, but as long as you can access the internet, you can access our application. Um, you can upload documents through your phone. You can sign in on your phone. Um, and so, but but if somebody can't do those things. We want to work with partners like Legal Aid, partners around the, the community uh, to make sure that that, that that is not an obstacle. What's a website people can go to uh, for both of your programs uh, to sign up or, or try to find more information on, uh, on other programs or rental assistance or uh, Legal Aid? So our website is erap.restorehope.org. E-R-A-P, Emergency Rent Assistance Program dot restorehope.org erap dot restorehope.org and that's the best place to find our permission and and eric can speak to legal aid and for people needing just resources generally and including getting to our programs you can dial 211 or go to the 211 website it's a pretty easy one for people to remember um, if you want to apply for legal aid or other free legal services in Oklahoma, you can visit oklegalconnect.org, and then Legal Aid specifically is at legalaidok.org. Yeah, we, I, I highly recommend 211. They're amazing partners, and so um, that's an easy number, as Eric said, for, for anybody to call any, anywhere in, in eastern Oklahoma, they can call that number and get help. Great. Thank you, guys. I think we're uh, about out of time, but uh, I want to thank both of you for joining us today, uh, Jer Jeff and Eric, um, and uh, thank you again, and uh, it's uh, been a pleasure speaking with you. If any, if any of our viewers would like to uh, read some of the stories that we've written on uh, evictions, COVID-19, or any host of other topics, uh, they can visit us, visit us at readfrontier.org or on our Facebook page or on Twitter at Read Frontier. If you'd like to reach out or submit news tips, uh, our general email is info at readfrontier.com. Uh, I'm Clifton Adcock, and uh, thanks for watching.